seasons. Are you kidding me? Over 50 episodes. <laughs> and 300 scenarios. Tell them thank you for being on What Would You Do? <laughs> Millions watch and watch and share. Oh! And share and watch. Okay, ready? But don't take my word this for it. My favorite show. Just watch. So, what would you do if you saw a young woman trying to trap her boyfriend into getting married? The one pregnancy test that I took this morning is twenty-five dollars. This is exactly what I need to get a ring on my finger. Boyfriend's coming in. Then. I have such good news. We're pregnant. Oh my god. <laughs> are you sure these are these are accurate? Well, you know what? I have more, so I will go take another one. Okay. Congratulations. Oh, God, thanks. Does it feel like that show? What would you do? How are you? Oh, my God. And what would you do if you saw this? Te gustaría a big kid burger? I want you to use English. It's America. Use English. Would you just sit there and watch? One, two, three, six. Would you stand up and step in? What do you think about that? Just keep to yourself. I don't want to. Sorry, you guys had to deal with that. You okay? Okay. I think we break it. You in too. Oh, my God. I couldn't handle it. And how about if at the bakery? We like this cake, but we wanted to know if it would go with this topper. You're having a lesbian wedding? Yes. I'm, I can't serve you. This happened right in front of you. We can't do a lesbian wedding. We would like to actually cancel our appointment, because if you're not going to serve them, that's not we're going to go too. I'm like shaking because I'm so pissed off that I'm sorry. I don't agree with what you just did. I think that's horrible. Someone brave enough to stand up to him deserves a cake. Here's your cake, ma'am. That was insane. <laughs> And you won't believe what happens in this Harlem barber shop. I wish I could cut you right now, but I got somebody who can definitely take care of you. Yo, what's up, man? The white dude? Yeah. Hell no. Hey, yo, big stone, how your hair looking now? Roll through respect. <laughs> it'll make you laugh. Hey, baby. And it'll make you think. You were the white girl? You couldn't find a strong black woman for you? Excuse me? You are ignorant. Much criticism as we went through as a people, you're gonna go and do it to the next person? They're ruining the black family. What? Drugs are ruining the black family. Poverty is ruining the black family. That white girl's not ruining the black family. Hayden, sir. She doesn't really work here. Uh, So when you think no one's watching, I'm John Quinones. Oh my God! This is what would you do? Are you serious? We are. <laughs> so the question is, what would you do? All right, thank you, Chris. How you? How you doing? Great to be here. Wow. Great group, great group. I saw a bunch of you at the bar last night. Uh, I wish we'd had hidden cameras there, you know? Lampshades, dancing on tables. You were out of control. <laughs> no, it was fun, it was fun. It's great to be here, great afternoon. An honor to be with all of you here in Wichita. Yes, I'm the host of that TV show, What Would You Do? The show that, that asks the question, when you see something disturbing, you witness injustice, and the little voice in the back of your head says, do something. Do you step in or do you step away? Um, it's fabulous. It's like a little uh, laboratory of human behavior uh, all across America. And we've been doing it for 10 years. And the show is back next Friday, a week from today, on ABC. So I hope you all watch. And it's also the show that's made it impossible for me to go to have dinner anywhere <laughs> without people asking, all right, John Quinones is here, what's gonna happen? You know, I'm like, I'm just, I'm gonna have dinner. <laughs> so I was on the airplane coming from New York and I sort of snuck up on the flight attendant on the way to Chicago yesterday and she turned around, we were face to face and she almost freaked out. She goes, oh my God, it's John Quinones. What's gonna happen on the airplane now? <laughs> so as a reporter, I, I've done a little research because I knew I was speaking to this beautiful health organization, health foundation, and I learned that, that according to the Centers for Disease Control, over the last 50 years, the U.S. has made great progress. We made progress toward improving and protecting our nation's health. In 1960, life expectancy for Americans was just under 70, 70 years old. Today, it's 79 years old, and it's getting better. People are living longer, healthier, and more productive lives. However, as you know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, this upward trend is neither as rapid as it should be, nor is it uniformly 
experienced by all of us. When it comes to heart disease, diabetes, infant mortality, blacks, Hispanics, even Asians fare much worse than whites in this country. We have to get rid of these ethnic barriers to health equity. You know, in 1966, the Reverend Martin Luther King said, of all the forms of inequality, inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and it's the most inhumane. And here we are half, half a century later, and the Reverend King, after he made those remarks, and not nearly enough progress has been made toward erasing these disparities. And that, that is why the work that the Kansas Health Foundation is doing in this state is such a, a beautiful example, I think, for the rest of the country. Uh, I am honestly blown away by what I've learned by the, about this foundation's success in improving and promoting health and wellness in schools, in our barrios, in neighborhoods, and in the workplace. As a reporter who's done too many stories about the fallacies and the shortcomings of the healthcare system in this country, I congratulate you for the way you grow leaders in your communities, you inspire decision makers, and act the way you act is such a strong, strong voice for healthy public policy. And I know about all this more than anyone, how important it is because of where I come from. You see a lot of people who only know me from watching me on television at the great ABC News with Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer and George Stephanopoulos and Robin Roberts. People who only know me from that, from seeing me up there on the tube, have no idea the long, hard struggle that it took for John Quinones to get to ABC News. We were born in poverty, just down the road in San Antonio, Texas. All right, several hundred miles down the road. <laughs> um, and you know how, how some, my dad was a janitor, and my mom used to clean houses on the rich part of town. You know how some people say, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor. We knew we were poor. <laughs> we had an old black and white television in the back of the house, and we saw how the other side lived. And you talk about disparity in health care. The Quinones family had, had no money for preventative care or any health insurance. Whenever any one of us got sick, my mother or my father or my two sisters, we'd go to the emergency room at the county hospital in San Antonio. And there we would wait hours and hours for care. My little sister suffered from high fevers and convulsions. And I can't tell you how many times I was terrified in the backseat of a car at the age of six years old as my dad sped to Robert B. Green Hospital in San Antonio to try to, try to get her fever down. That's all we had. My, dog, my father he used to cut trees down for a living also in his spare time. And there was this big chipper. I don't know if you, you know these machines that grind tree limbs into mulch. His hand got caught in there, and he lost his index figure. Wound up going to the hospital, lost it. That was the end of it. No, no, you know, no time to go back there and do follow-up care. Uh, you know, my sister Irma, my older sister, was born at home with the help of a midwife. This wasn't in some little country town. This was in the big city of San Antonio. So it was tough. As a little boy, when I was eight years old, I, I was trying to do everything I could. I was desperate to help my family out. Uh, and so I shined shoes. Uh, I was eight years old. I shined shoes on, on Guadalupe Street in San Antonio, charging 10 cents a pair, me and my cousin Joe. And we would go to all the cantinas, the bars in San Antonio, because the drunk guys didn't realize how much they were tipping you. <laughs> and we made a killing uh, until one night. It was a tough neighborhood. Uh, a gang jumped us, me and my cousin Joey. And they took all our rags and my polishes and the earnings from, from that night. And that was the end of my shoe shining career. Uh, when I was, I didn't speak English when I was six years old. And this was in, in, in San Antonio. My, my family's been in San Antonio. Five generations, maybe seven, according to, depending on who you talk to. So we've been there all along. So I, I get a kick when people say, John Quinones, you're Mexican-American. When did you come across the border to Mexico? It's like. <laughs> We've been there hundreds of years, you know? <laughs> Texas was once part of Spain. Texas was once part of Mexico. I didn't cross the border. The border crossed me, you know? <laughs> what the heck? And suddenly, suddenly we're speaking English. Uh, but I love this country, of course. I'm an American first, but very proud of also of the Hispanic 
uh, background. But when I was six years old, I didn't speak a word of English. Went to the first grade. I'll never forget being in Mrs. Gregory's first grade class. She didn't speak a word of Spanish. I didn't speak English. And at 10 in the morning, there I am, you know, twiddling my thumbs, wondering what the heck's going on. I didn't go to pre-kinder or kindergarten or any of that. And at 10 in the morning, the bell rings. And of course, the kids all go out to recess, right? It's playtime. So they go out to the, uh, to the recreation area. Where does little Juanito Quinones go? I walked home. <laughs> I, lived, I lived two blocks from school. And I got home, and my mother Maria, God rest her soul, it's like 10 in the morning. She goes, Juanito, ¿qué pasó? What are you doing here? And I said in Spanish to her, Se acabó. It's over, Mom. I like school. Two hours, and <laughs> I think this is going to work out. <laughs> she grabbed me by the ear and dragged me back to class. But it was tough. They would punish us in school for speaking Spanish. If the coach caught us speaking Spanish, they would give us three licks. And the coach had a big paddle, a wooden paddle, with holes drilled into it for extra speed and power. And we would get hit on our rear ends if we were caught speaking Spanish. When I was 13 years old, my father was laid off from work as a janitor. And we did what a lot of Hispanic families in South Texas did back then. We, we became migrant farm workers. So my father Bruno, my mother Maria, and my two sisters and I jumped in the back of these trucks and we journeyed. 1,700 miles from San Antonio to Northport, Michigan, past Traverse City, close to the Canadian border, where we picked cherries for 75 cents a bucket. And I remember it would take me like two hours to fill this darn bucket, teetering on ladders, you know, looking at these orchards. And then we did what all the migrant workers do. We followed after six weeks there, we followed the crops down to Ohio, outside of Toledo, Ohio where we picked tomatoes for 35 cents a bushel. And I was like a champion tomato picker, man. I, I do 100 bushels a day. That's $35 way back then. And my father would pick about as many, and then my sisters and my mom. And we learned the value of the family coming together, right? And pulling themselves up by their bootstraps when times were tough. I remembered the words of the Reverend Martin Luther King, who said, when times are tough and you need faith, Faith, faith is taking that first step. It doesn't matter if you don't see the entire staircase. Just take that first step, because then there'll be another and another. But I'll never forget being on my knees on the cold, hard ground in Swanton, Ohio, at 6 in the morning, looking at a row of tomato plants that, for a young 13-year-old boy's eyes, seemed to go on for miles and miles. That's what I had to look forward to that day. And my father, Bruno, looking down at me and saying, Juanito, you want to do this for the rest of your life? Or do you want to get a college education? It was a no-brainer. <laughs> I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life, but no one believed in me. When I was growing up in San Antonio, I was put in this category of just another Mexican kid in a Mexican neighborhood who probably doesn't have what it takes to go to college. And as a little boy, I, I dreamed of being a television reporter. I used to watch Geraldo Rivera on, remember him, on 2020, the only Latino. It turns out he's only half, but you know. <laughs> but he was the only Latino on 2020. He was this young, swashbuckling, with mustache, long hair, blue jeans, and he traveled the world telling stories. And I dreamed of someday being like Geraldo. But whenever I would ask my in junior high, I would ask my teachers and my counselors, how do I prepare for college? How do I take the SATs or the ACTs? How do I get advanced placement classes, right? You know what they would, say, what, what they would tell me? They would say, John, it's, it's wonderful that you have this idea of someday, this dream of someday being a reporter, but we think you should try wood shop or metal shop or auto mechanics. Not that there's anything wrong with those trades. A lot of people make a good hard living, right? But I wanted to go to college, and those teachers did what people do on what would you do every Friday night. They judged me by the color of my skin and the accent in my voice. Thank God for my mom, Maria, who was the one who believed in me. She was the one who would say to me, John, it doesn't matter that you have to wear the same clothes to school every other day. At least we wash those clothes, right? They're clean. She would say, so I was embarrassed uh, the lunch she would prepare for us to take to school. She would say, don't, don't be embarrassed about taking bean and tortilla tacos for lunch when all the other kids are taking their fancy bologna and white bread. 
Now we find out that beans have more protein, right? It's a better meal. <laughs> but I was embarrassed back then. And she would say, don't be embarrassed. What matters is what's in here, in your cabeza, and what's in here, in your corazón. And thank God for Maria. She's the one that, that, that made me think, maybe this is possible. But I had a heavy Mexican accent. You know, in Spanish, there is no SH sound. So you say, these are my chews, this is my shirt, and people made fun of it. And I knew that if I was going to be a reporter on television, like Peter Jennings, all my heroes, Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, and Geraldo Rivera, I would have to get rid of my accent. So I started doing whatever I could to, to work on it. And I did something that, I, you're not going to believe this, but I was painfully shy when I was a little boy in junior high school. I would never be able to speak to a group like this. So I, um, but I forced myself to try out for drama classes and for a play, a citywide production of Romeo and Juliet. So I tried out for Romeo. Now maybe it's because very few other guys tried out, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I got the role. And the good news is that I got to kiss Juliet, this really hot high school girl, <laughs> Maria, Mary Lou Gomez. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we had to practice behind the, the curtain, of course, uh, to get it right. So we had to be convincing with this Romeo and Juliet kiss. The bad news was that in this very macho Mexican school in San Antonio, I had to wear leotards. So just, just thank God there was no YouTube back then to come back and haunt me. But, you know, I, I, that's what got me to, to perfect my delivery so I could enunciate to the back of the room and, and, and work on my SHs and CHs and differentiate between the two. And then I, I got into high school and then I met my first hero, my teacher, my English teacher, Mrs. Gutierrez, who was the first one in my life who said, besides my mother, who said, John, I, I love the way you write your essays. You know, you're a great writer. Have you thought about journalism? I said, of course, I've been watching Geraldo all these years, right? <laughs> She goes, well, you, you should talk to, to the man who runs the school newspaper here at in Brackenridge High School in San Antonio, Mr. Harris. So she introduced me to Mr. Harris, and I got hired as a reporter. So I've been a reporter since I was 14. Um, and within a couple of months, I was the chief of editorials for the school newspaper. So there I was doing these big investigative stories in, at Brackenridge High School, like, why are the teachers parking in the students' parking spaces? You know. <laughs> Tonight we go undercover and find out. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved writing and reporting, and so it began then. And then came another hero in my life, and heroes don't have to be human beings. In my case, it was a government program called Upward Bound. And I know some of you are familiar with it. Um, it was a brilliant idea. Uh, you know, the way they, the government knew, the Johnson and Kennedy administrations knew, that the schools were doing a pretty lousy job in the inner cities, at least in some neighborhoods, of preparing us or not preparing us for college. So the government would supplement that by sending us to classes every Saturday of our high school career. And every summer, we got to spend six weeks living on a college campus. Now, for a Latino kid who was the first one in his family to go to college, whose parents didn't understand their little boy going off and living somewhere else, this was a big deal. And even when I went to Upward Bound for those six weeks in San Marcos, Texas, from San Antonio, which was 50 miles, five zero, right? I'm saying goodbye to my mother in the driveway. And she's in tears. She's like, mijo, when am I going to see you again? And this is, this is horrible. And like, mom, I'll be back. This is, it's an hour away. I'll be back Saturday with some dirty laundry. <laughs> and some of those refried bean tacos, right? So um, I got, uh, because of Upward Bound, I got to go to college. I had three jobs, I struggled, and I tell kids all the time, you gotta do everything you can. I had three jobs. I worked in the geology department at St. Mary's University. I worked in the cafeteria, and at night, I gotta be careful how I say this, because people assume the worst, because I'm a Latino. I, when I tell them I deliver drugs, they presume, you know, drug dealer. No, I was a delivery man for a pharmacy. So I drove a beat up Volkswagen, and I would take little old ladies and little old men their medicine. People, the prescription medicine, people who couldn't come to the drugstore. The owner of that uh, drugstore, Mr. Mr. Uh, Blouser, found out that I was interested in broadcasting because he would hear me in the men's room. I had a little beat up recorder, 
tape recorder and I would practice my delivery and I would read whatever I could get my hands on, milk cartons, whatever, just to practice on my delivery. And I was, this was between my deliveries, right? And he heard me outside the men's room door and he said, John, you really want to do broadcasting? I said, yes. He goes, well, I know the general manager of this radio station here in San Antonio and they're looking for interns. And I was a freshman in college, so I was 18. I bugged him and I bugged him and I bugged him to get me to that station and he did, he introduced me. And I got hired as an intern for $2 an hour. And you gotta be from Texas to understand this. But first of all, it was a country music station. When I was a kid, I liked rock music, R&B, Tejano music. I wasn't a big fan of country music. I am now, but I wasn't back then. Anyway, it's a country music station, and um, the, the disc jockeys who played the music uh, had horses in the back of the studios that they would use in parades and public appearances, right, in rodeos. My first job in broadcasting for two dollars an hour <laughs> was to feed the horses and clean up after the horses back in their corral at the studio. But at night, at night, I would sneak into the control room on these big reel-to-reel -reel recorders on a microphone, and I would record my voice, reading all kinds of wire stories and newspapers, trying to perfect my delivery. Uh, the only problem was at that hour of the night, at midnight, <laughs> There were very few professionals to come criticize my work. The disc jockeys had all gone home, right? It was all on tape by then. The only one who could come in and criticize my work was the janitor, and his name was Pablo. <laughs> so, and his Spanish was worse than English, was worse than my dad. So I, I, nonetheless, I would bring in Pablo and I'd say, Pablo, listen to me. How does this sound? And he would go, más o menos, more or less. It sounds <laughs> and then the station let me do something on the air for the first time. And it was, uh, there'd be some nationally produced commercial, right? And I would get to do the last four second tag to make it local. There'd be new, some new medicine out, and I would get to, so you want to hear what the first thing John Quinones ever said on the radio? I got to say, now available at Walgreens. And I was, <laughs> I was so proud of myself, so proud, so proud. <laughs> I'd call my mother and my aunts and my grandma. You got to listen at 112, but, you gotta, <laughs> but don't blink because you'll miss it. And then they finally let me do the news. And again, step by step, a little baby steps to get to ABC News. They let me do the news on Sunday nights. It was actually Monday morning between one and four in the morning. Five minutes of news on the hour. I think we had four listeners, my mother, my father, and my two sisters. <laughs> but you get to make mistakes. That's where you, you don't want to get commit big blunders on ABC network news, right? You want to make your mistakes in a little country station on the outskirts of San Antonio. And I loved it. And from there, I got a job at another radio station. And then I got a fellowship to study at Columbia University for a master's in journalism for this kid who had never been out of Texas except to pick tomatoes and cherries. To go study in Manhattan at Columbia, this Ivy League school, and get a master's was unbelievable. And I loved it. And from there I got a job in Chicago as a local reporter in Chicago at the CBS station because of my degree from Columbia, because no one in Texas, by the way, would hire me in television. It's like they all had their one Hispanic reporter and the quota had been met and I was too late. I had to go to graduate school and get a master's to prove myself, almost to be twice as qualified as the other reporters. But who cares? I wound up in Chicago, big market. And while I was in Chicago, I did a story that I had wanted to do for a long time. And it's about an issue that's still a hot button issue today in all the conversations about the next president, immigration, and something you're familiar with here in this day too. And I, being Mexican American from South Texas, I wanted to know, I wanted to show people what are the push factors that make someone go leave their home, their little village in Mexico, leave their families, their mothers, their wives, their children, risk their lives crossing the Rio Grande or the desert to come get a job here as a dishwasher or a roofer for very little money. How bad must things be? So I convinced my news director in Chicago, to, I was 25 years old, to let me go down to Mexico and go undercover, right? And, and pretend I was just another undocumented worker from Mexico trying to get into the U.S. I told my friends, I'm going to I'm going to go, I'm going to pose as a Mexican to which, 
To which they all said, it's not going to take a lot of acting, John. You, know? <laughs> you are Mexican. But I wanted to pose as just another undocumented person trying to get across the border. So I went undercover with a hidden camera, uh, found a smuggler. They call him a coyote, right? A coyote who for $300 sold me a fake birth certificate and a fake social security card, all captured on hidden camera. And then he says, tonight I'll show you where we're crossing the Rio Grande in Laredo, Texas. So I had to then get in my car, I had a rental car, and go tell the camera crew from CBS where to hide in the bushes so that they could capture me, right, coming across on an inner tube. And then I went back into Mexico. Back then you could go back and forth relatively easily. So I got in my rental car, went back to Mexico. I had to stash the rental car because I didn't want the smuggler to see my national rental car, you know, Lincoln town car, and uh, wondering, get very suspicious about this young <laughs> immigrant and how much money he had. Thank God they didn't assault me, because down on the banks of the Rio Grande, you know, these smugglers, they know that these people have been saving all their lives for this crossing, so they've got some cash. Uh, he could have easily beaten me up, killed me, you know, or at least wounded, injured me, taken my money and left me for dead on the banks of the Rio Grande. Who's going to care? I would be just another Mexican worker who, immigrant, who was trying to cross the border illegally anyway, so who would care? But thank God he was an honest smuggler. He was, a, he was a good coyote. And that night, he puts me on an inner tube. And I, had to, I was worried because I was wearing a wireless microphone under my t-shirt. And he wanted me to take my clothes off and put them in a plastic bag so that when you cross the river, you can put on your dry clothes. Uh, but I convinced him to let me keep the t-shirt on. And sure enough, we get on an inner tube. And I floated across the Rio Grande to Laredo, Texas, all captured by my camera crew hiding in the bushes on the Texas side of the river. And I didn't stop there. I then got on a, on a Greyhound bus uh, on hidden camera following the journey and went back to Chicago. Because remember, this was for a Chicago station, so we wanted to make it about the Chicago area, the market. And I got a job at a restaurant, at a Greek restaurant in Chicago, where we had heard that the owner of this restaurant had seven Mexican workers illegally working for him, and he hadn't paid them in 16 weeks. And every time they complained, he would say, hey guys, you get to sleep here in the basement, you get to eat all the food you want, you keep complaining, and I'm going to call immigration and have you deported. Which, by the way, still happens today. So I got a job there. I pretended I just arrived from Mexico. I spoke only Spanish. And the guy hired me as a dishwasher. So by day, I'm washing dishes there. Uh, and at night, I'm down in the, in the basement with the rest of the guys. And I still wonder what, what they must have thought. Because they see me washing dishes with them during the day speaking Spanish. And then I pull out a little camera. And I start interviewing them about their lives. And they told me how they were held as virtual slaves in that restaurant. They were sleeping next to the dishes, and the silverware, and the cans of food. The next day, I came back to the restaurant, this time wearing a suit, speaking fluent English, with a camera crew behind me. And I remember we had to chase the owner of the restaurant through the parking lot because he didn't want to talk to me about what he was doing. But the day after it aired on television, the U.S. government moved in, shut down the restaurant, got the Mexican workers the money and temporary visas to stay while they worked on their visas, and they arrested the owner and shut down the restaurant. And I knew then that those were the kinds of stories that as a Hispanic reporter I could tell better than anyone because of where I come from. Um, I see journalism as a, imagine this room being pitch dark, right? It's nighttime, the lights are all out, we are stumbling around over each other. We can't even see our hands in front of our faces. But the journalist, he or she, is the person with a little flashlight or the candle. And they can shine it on the darkest corners of this room to illuminate corruption, to illuminate injustice, to illuminate human rights violations, civil rights violations. I think when, when journalism is done right, and God knows we're not doing it right too often these days, when we're doing it right, those are the kinds of stories that we should be telling. Um, but back to that border crossing, my producer was now a, a producer at 60 Minutes, was working me, with me as a local producer. And, 
uh, on that story crossing the border, and he said, John, you're the, you're the first Mexican to swim across the Rio Grande and then go to his suite at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. <laughs> I had to change clothes, but it won an Emmy Award, that story, my first Emmy. And ABC News was watching. Peter Jennings, my hero, was watching in, in New York. And they were particularly interested because Central America, this was the 1980s, and Central America was blowing up. There were wars going on in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Panama. And ABC News had a correspondent by the name of Bill Stewart. And if you Google Bill Stewart, ABC News, you'll see what happened to him. He was shot and killed on camera, our ABC correspondent, in Nicaragua, because he couldn't communicate with the soldiers. And the networks then, in all their wisdom, said, we should hire somebody who speaks Spanish to go to Latin America. <laughs> and there I was with my little Emmy Award. And um, the great irony didn't escape me. Here was this guy, this kid, John Quinones, who used to get punished for speaking Spanish in school, remember? The coach would hit us. And I, get, I wind up getting my dream network job at ABC News precisely because I speak Spanish. And I was based in Miami, and I covered Latin America for years, for a decade. Nicaragua, El Salvador, the Contras, the Sandinistas. It was a wild and crazy time. In fact, we're talking to a some TV producers who want to do a television series about that era and about a Hispanic reporter who winds up going to those places. And I worked with Peter Jennings, my hero. You remember Peter, right? We still, we still miss him. He's been gone now for nine years. And uh, he was intimidating I me. Mean, he was my hero. So he was like James Bond, this guy, right? He looked so debonair and he was so classy and he had a great accent. And, and by the way, what's... Why can he have an accent and I, not me? I, was, I, I still don't get it. It was a British accent, a Canadian accent. So uh, one day I was in Nicaragua and I had this big exclusive interview with the president of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega. And for a 28 year old reporter, my first big story, I was very excited. So I called New York and I got Peter Jennings on the phone from Nicaragua, he's in New York. And I tell him I got this big exclusive for tonight. He goes, fine, young man. I don't think he even knew my name. <laughs> he said, great, we're looking forward to your exclusive interview. And then I hang up the phone, and I get a call from the president's office in Nicaragua canceling the interview. So now it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The network news is on at 6.30, 5.30 here, right? And I'm, I'm petrified because i got to tell them that the story that I had promised Peter Jennings <laughs> wasn't going to happen. So I have to call, you know, agent 007 in New York, and I explain to him, and I expect it to be yelled at, who knows, maybe even fired, right? For, for because they had made a two, two minute hole in the newscast, and now they had to fill it with something else, thanks to my story falling apart. And instead, instead, Peter Jennings said to me words that I'll never forget. He said, John, don't worry so much about talking to the movers and the shakers down there. Latin America. Talk to the moved and the shaken. In other words, talk to the real people. You, as a Latino reporter, can go into the countryside and interview the peasants, the real victims of war and mudslides and, 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 and hurricanes and earthquakes in Latin America, the victims of war, you know, because you have that special ability to speak the language. The politicians, forget it. They can all call a press conference, right? They can gather the press and issue out their little press release. But people who don't have a voice, you should endeavor to give those folks a voice. And that's what I did. That's what I tried to do for the next 10 years. And my favorite stories all had to do with, with children. I mean, I wound up in Colombia, South America one time. I was covering the presidential elections in, in Bogota, Colombia, when I ran into some kids on the street who were stealing things from tourists, right? Like necklaces and watches. And then at night, I saw them open the manhole covers on the streets of Bogota and climb into the sewers. And I asked the woman who worked for us, I said, who, who are those kids? And she goes, oh, they're called gamines. They're like runaways, castaway kids. Some of them as young as six and seven years old. And there's 300 of them. And they're homeless. And they live in the sewers. And I just, I was dumbfounded. And I knew that I had a, a big story here. I said, well, who's trying to help them? And she goes, well, there's one man 
His name is Jaime Jaramillo, and Jaime is a wealthy industrialist who finds oil for American oil companies in Latin America. But he can't sleep at night knowing that there are people, the youngest of folks from his country, who have to live in the sewer systems. So he goes down there, he puts on some waders, you know, some big old boots, carries a loaf of bread and a bucket of chicken and a six pack of Cokes. With a little old flashlight, he goes through the sewers and they're, they're the only one these boys trust. He's the only one they trust. And he tries to do what he can at night. And I said, what about the government? What is the government doing about the homeless kids? And she goes, oh, shoot. The government of, 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 of Colombia, the cops and the military, they don't want these homeless kids on the street. They're trying to clean up the streets. So, but, but they're afraid to go down there into this dark world, because you can imagine the diseases that fester in the sewer systems along the rivers of waste of 30 million Colombians. She said the cops won't go there, but what they do is they open the manhole covers on the street and they pour gasoline down there and they throw a match to burn them out. And this hero who worked with the kids, Jaime Jaramillo, I went to his house and he showed me album, photo albums with pictures of these kids whose faces were melted by the fires that the military and the police had started. And I knew I had to tell that story. And I knew it wasn't a two minute piece for the evening news on Peter Jennings. I knew it was more of a magazine story like Dateline and 2020 and Primetime Live, but I wasn't one of the chosen correspondents for those shows. Nonetheless, I called New York and I said, look, this is an amazing story that I have to tell here. And it's about these kids who live, they're sewer kids. And the producer was Sunday night at home in New York said, uh, yeah, John, but who's gonna go into the sewers? I said, we are, I have a camera crew and we're willing to go down there. And he said, yeah, if, if you're crazy enough to go into the sewers to bring me back a story, who are we to say no? So I spent two weeks in the, in the bowels of Bogota, Colombia with these kids. I met a girl who was 16 years old who had given birth to a baby three weeks before. Can you imagine starting life out in the sewer systems of a big metropolis like that? Uh, we spent two weeks down there and wrapped up our shooting. We took it back to New York. And a few weeks later, we edited the story and put it on primetime live. And the day after it aired, American viewers like yourselves sent in a million dollars in donations. And Jaime Jaramillo, this hero who's trying to do his best with a loaf of bread and a six pack of Cokes, was able to build an orphanage for those kids. And they pulled them all out of the sewers. Again, the power of that camera when it's used the right way. Some of those kids are now, you know, taking tennis lessons in Florida and uh, skiing in Colorado. But it was all about the power of the media, again, when it's used in the right way. And that's all I wanted to do, those kinds of stories. So I went to Haiti and I did a story about children who are forced to work on sugarcane plantations. That won an Emmy. The sewer kid story won an Emmy. I won seven Emmys and they still wouldn't hire me on primetime live until finally they did. And I loved it. And um, I went all over the world, interviewed everyone from Fidel Castro to Jane Goodall in Africa, who studied chimpanzees for 30 years by herself. I spent three weeks with her in the jungles of Gambi National Park in Tanzania. But it's funny, after all those awards and after all those stories, the one show that people recognize me more for the day <laughs> is What Would You Do? Again, the story that puts you, the, 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 the show that forces you to decide whether it's to get involved or not when you see something that's disturbing. It's like a candid camera. Some of you who are here old enough to remember candid camera. It's a candid camera of ethics and morals. And it's hilarious the way people respond. And not only the way they respond, but who responds. Sometimes the person we think is gonna step in and do the right thing, you know, big dude, uh, comes in and he's got shaved head and tattoos and we're doing a, a piece on racism and we'll be, I'm hiding in the back room and I, I say to my camera crew, oh God, this guy's gonna be a racist. Look at him, he came on a motorcycle and he's, he's a big dude, he's shaved head, looks like a skinhead. He turns out to be a teddy bear, right? Surprises us all. And then along comes a little old lady with a flower in her hair and the pretty pink dress. She turns out to be the meanest witch you can imagine. <laughs> It's really fun to watch these things develop behind the scenes. Somebody told me the other day, 
the, as the greatest compliment. They said, John, the world would be a better place if we all thought John Quinones was in the next room <laughs> always documenting our behavior because we would be on our best behavior, right? And I brought along one of my favorite scenarios. You want to see it? It's about homelessness. What do you do if you witness someone mistreating a homeless person? So if you can roll the tape, we can talk about it afterward. So here it is. They are those among us with the least. Almost half a million people who call the streets home. Their meals, whatever they can find, whatever they are given. Help me out, get something to eat. What would you do if you saw a good Samaritan give a homeless man $20 for a bite to eat? So get whatever you want, okay? There's only to see him toss back to the curb the second she leaves. Just, it's bad for business. I can't let you sit in here. A man denied service simply because he's homeless. Today, we've brought our hidden cameras to the streets of Lindbrook, New York, and McQuaid's restaurant. Of course, both Tracy and Kevin are actors, and the bartender, Jeremy? It's not your money, get out of here. He's definitely an actor. Everyone at this bar knows it, except this man. And our hidden cameras are rolling. Oh, wow, it's nice in here. Hi, this is a friend of mine. Can you, do you have a menu or something he can look at? Just get it whatever you want, okay? Here's $20. That's really, really nice. Sure, sure, right sure. away, he takes notice. Take care, okay? Thank you so I much. I have to get back to work. But as soon as Tracy leaves, Jeremy has a change of heart. Listen, man, uh, they have places that you can go and you can get it like a soup kitchen or something. I'm a paying customer. Look, I mean, I got that's, $20. That's not your money. I don't want you to bother these paying customers. I'm not bothering anybody. Okay. Am I bothering you? Then why don't you leave? He's being polite. Perhaps, but for Oleg Babsky, this is about more than manners. Yeah, but you took his $20. Not his $20. Yeah. His $20, she gave it to him for him to eat. I heard it. Okay, but if I give this 20 back to him, what's he going to do? Whatever he wants to do, it's his money. He's going to go buy liquor. He wants to eat. That's what he's looking for. We've barely begun here, but already a bold move. Uh, who are you calling? Police. You're calling the police on me? Yeah. He makes it clear to Jeremy it's meal or no deal. Give him back the 20. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is quite so welcoming. Uh-oh, we got a homeless guy outside. But now the homeless guy is inside. Do you have a menu that, he, that I can look at? These two women don't want a homeless man seated anywhere near them. These ladies, and, and I can smell you too, you smell. And when Jeremy intervenes, they offer an alternative. He's bothering you, right? Don't let him, let him take something to go to eat. But he shouldn't sit here, right? No, no. I'll be outside, okay, sir? Sorry about that, lady. No, it's fine. Right when the kid be smelling. Hope that didn't ruin your appetite. Well, no. <laughs> Tough day for Kevin. These next two men also give him the cold shoulder. Am I bothering you guys? I'm just trying to get something to eat. These guys work, right? They work all their lives, they pay for their food. They won't even look our homeless man in the face. Excuse me. Please don't get involved here. Yeah. You can't. We are ruined the place. Imagine you're down on your luck. Sir. Help a guy out. Sir, mind your own business. Thank you guys. For With his pleas falling on deaf ears, we tell Kevin to leave. Sorry guys. You feed him once, you feed him twice, and there's 20 guys sitting here. They agree with Jeremy. Why? I think it was wrong for a lady to walk in here, bring a homeless guy in here. If that's her friend, take the money and buy a sandwich somewhere. But not here. Wrong place. Wrong place. And as this next man walks in, things only get worse. I'll run him through the dishwasher in the back. Just want to get a little bit of food. Don't, don't cough on everything. <laughs> Along with Jeremy, he literally laughs at Kevin's misfortune. Can I please get a sandwich? No. Oh my God. Give the guy a couple of croutons that are on the floor in the kitchen or something. Mm. I'm a paying customer, man. Here's the thing. I don't work at a soup kitchen. I work in a bar, okay? <laughs> when you go... It seems like he couldn't care less about our homeless man. But then he realizes there's more at stake here. 
can you give me my money back then, please? Confiscate I'm not going to give you the money back. Give the guy his money. You got to give him his money back at least. If he gets caught somewhere else, whatever. You going to buy booze with this? No. You now watch what happens when Kevin leaves the restaurant. I just don't think homeless people should be allowed in bars, you know? How did he end up here? He wasted his money. Well, I mean, we don't know that. We don't know that. That's true. I mean, he looks like a decent guy. A decent guy. And as it turns out, so is Anthony Gambino. Do me a favor, make the guy a sandwich and put it on the bill, right? Make him a sandwich and make put it on the Okay. Kevin, you're still standing by out there, right? Yeah. This guy has said he just wants to buy you a sandwich. You're kidding me, that guy? Which, what kind of sandwich should I get him? Turkey burger? Turkey burger. Nah, he needs a little something more than that. More than that? That's for Weight Watchers. Get him the, uh, the short skirt steak tacos. A lot of protein in that? 100%. And now Anthony, a man who seconds ago was insulting Kevin, hand delivers his meal. Before he buys him a round of drinks, time to introduce ourselves. <laughs> Started off joking with the guy. Kind yeah, of, I was messing around with him. I was trying to rile him up a little bit on his first day. And then you wind up doing something that totally surprised us. You know, I've had some hard times in my life, and you know, other people would have for me, you know, so I try and do the same thing. Paying it forward. This next man understands that concept all too well as soon as he sees Kevin on the street. Thanks, bud. No, can you just sit right here? Seconds later, Kevin is seated right next to him. I don't want you to bother anybody. I don't want you to bother this nice He didn't, he didn't bother me. Thank you. Why don't you have some soup? If you've never been there, you don't know what's there. Well, I work, you know. Yeah, we all work. All of us have dead times. Can I get like a glass of water? Just, just water? What, the free thing on the menu? A small request that leads to a touching moment. Thank you. you now you're making him give you his drink. No, don't worry about it. Thank you. You're welcome. To your health. To yours too. Thanks. Better times. Mm. But from Jeremy, the insults just keep getting worse. Sure, there's a hose out there somewhere. You don't have to be cruel, man. Want me to be cruel? Get out of here. Hope you enjoyed your water. Why'd you take the money, buddy? And you know what he's gonna do? He's I gonna buy drugs what? and alcohol with he it. He may, but you can't take that money from him. You take that money from him and you'll steal it, and I will make sure that you get arrested for it. Why are you defending a homeless guy? Because you're a prick. Thank you. Kevin leaves. Sorry if it upset you. I hope I did the right thing. No, you didn't. And Arnie Gerber is full of emotion. You think I was wrong? Absolutely. Completely wrong. Really? You never had been in bad shape. You never had you needed help. You never had anything happened to you that you wish you didn't or you wish you could get out. Well, we don't know what that happened to this person. It's a message that's very personal to Arnie. And you said to him, haven't you ever been through hard times? No, haven't we all? Well, everybody's been through hard times. And we survive them in some way. And if somebody helps you and gives you a push-up, fine. Almost half of the people we met this day did just that. They spoke up for a hungry stranger down on his luck. Heroes? They don't think so. But heroic is the guy that landed the plane in the Hudson River. That's heroic. And it, wouldn't anybody else do the same thing? Yeah, that's one of my favorites. It's pretty amazing, huh? Well, yeah. um, just, um, you never know who's going to walk in the door and, and just restore your faith in humanity just when you think it's going to hell in the handbasket. Uh, there's someone in virtually every one of our scenarios who does the right thing. You know, uh, again, I, I want to quote the Reverend Martin Luther King once said that our lives begin to end the moment we stay silent about things that matter. And that's the whole premise behind the show, you know, not to be silent. 
It's funny, sometimes people won't say anything. And all it takes is for one person to sound the alarm. It's almost as if we're all waiting for someone else to go first. But once someone does, then everyone joins in. Um, and we've done all kinds of scenarios. We've done some funny ones, some serious ones. One of my favorite funny ones is, I don't know if you saw the bicycle theft one. We were at a park and we chained a brand new bicycle to a pole right along a jogging path to see what people would do if they saw someone stealing it. Brand new bicycle chain, an actor comes in with a chainsaw and wire cutters and starts cutting the chain. And we told the actor, if people ask you if you're stealing the bike, admit it. Say, yes, I'm stealing this bike. Because we wanted folks to know and not to think that he had lost his key. So we first did it with a white young man, about 26 years old, you know, baseball cap and polo shirt with a chain and I mean a wire cutters and a hacksaw and he's cutting the chain. And when he was doing it, people going along this jogging path where people are walking their dogs and pushing their baby strollers and jogging, um, they saw him and they muttered something under their breath, they shook their head, but no one called 911 when it was a white thief. And then we changed things around, as we often do, and now we had an African-American young man dressed the same way, the same age, with the hacksaw and the wire cutters. Within four seconds, people surrounded him like a posse, and not only called 911, which they should have done with, with the other guy, but they started taking video of him with their cell phone saying, we got you now. Even the black actor was like, John, this is ridiculous. The white guy got away with it. <laughs> and then as a final twist, we had a very attractive young woman. Short shorts, tight t-shirt, blonde hair blowing in the wind with her hacksaw and wire cutters. <laughs> Men helped her steal the bike. <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> time and again, men stepped up to the challenge. Uh, there was one man with his wife, a middle-aged couple on their bicycles out for a bike ride, and the wife said to him, honey, she is stealing that bike. And he goes, yes, but she's a damsel in distress. She needs help. So he's pulling the bike out of the pole, you know, and of course the actress is going along with it, saying, you're so strong. He's like, thank you, thank you. And then she asked him, do you see any cops around? So now he's looking for the police. Now he's an accomplice, right? I still wonder what the ride home with his wife must have been like once we told him it was what would you do. But my favorite ones are the ones that deal with more serious issues. The one we were doing about, what do you do if you're walking down the sidewalk and you see the person in front of you collapse? Right? And you're in a hurry. It's 8 in the morning and you got to get to work or to school. So we did it right by the train station in Newark, New Jersey. And we had an actor, uh, an actress actually, a middle-aged woman, well-dressed, who's walking, she's a stunt artist, an actress, right? And she collapses and she knows how to fall very convincingly and, uh, and passes out. It could, be, it could be she had a heart attack, it could be she just fainted, you never know. Within seconds, four seconds, people stepped in and helped her when it was a well-dressed businesswoman. Uh, time and again, they put a pillow under her head. They call 911, right? They call for an ambulance. Now, we always notify the police and the ambulance so they don't really send one. We don't want to waste taxpayer dollars. But they did it over and over, thinking they were calling 911. So then we said, wow, it's pretty impressive. But what if we switch things up now? And instead of this well-dressed you know, businesswoman, It'll be a homeless man who's older, disheveled, dirty, smelly, holding a beer can, and he collapses. So we had an actor, a stunt artist, do that. He's walking along, he falls, 88 people go by, and no one is stopping. People are stepping over him. And one lady made the sign of the cross and kept going, and uh, we were blown away. And we said, well, I guess if you're homeless, you're, you're not going to get much help here. And I was about to go out and break the scene, as I always do with the big cameras, when suddenly into the hidden camera monitor, I see the face. First, I hear uh, the walking, uh, a walking cane on the sidewalk. You know, she's coming along the sidewalk. And into the frame of the picture comes this beautiful African-American woman who has got a cane because she suffered a stroke. And guess what? She's homeless herself. And guess what? She stops. 
and she starts asking people going by, excuse me, do you have a cell phone? Can you call 911 for this man? Excuse me, can anyone get some help here for this man? 22 more people go by and no one is stopping. So she's standing there, she, she stumbles over and, uh, and did something we totally did not expect. She grabs the beer can out of the homeless man's actor's hands and she puts it in a trash can as if she was trying to give him a little bit of dignity, right? Thinking maybe then people will stop. 32 more people go by, we're counting them and no one is stopping. She looks up to the heavens, and we saw this because the hidden camera was right on her face, and she was like, she made a fist to the heavens as if she, to curse God for not having anyone stop, right? Like, God, how can you allow this to happen? And then she stumbles over again, and we knew this because the actor on the ground was wearing a wireless microphone. And she leans over and she goes, sir, I don't know your name, but I'm gonna call you Billy. And my name is Linda Hamilton. And don't you worry, my man, I'm homeless too, and I'm gonna stay here until help arrives. And then finally, a woman, by the way, most of the time it's women who step in, a woman stops. And ironically, I asked her why she stopped, and she goes, because I watch your show, and I promised, <laughs> and I promised my kids that if I ever witnessed something like this, I would stop. But so I interview the people, and there's a lot of chaos when I come out, right? People go, oh, it's the show, and we gotta get releases signed, and, and there's a lot of mayhem. And in that madness, we lost our hero. Linda Hamilton, the homeless woman who stopped to help, walked away. So we knew her name, but we didn't have a contact information because she was homeless. Uh, but anyway, a couple of weeks later, we put the scenario on what would you do on the air. And the day after it aired, we got hundreds of calls and on Twitter and emails, people calling ABC News in New York saying, who was that woman? We want to help her. And they started fundraising. They, they created a Facebook page for this woman, a stranger, uh, called Touched by an Angel, Touched by Linda Hamilton. And they started collecting. They collected $8,000. And now they want me to go find her and give it to her. So of course we have to do that. So our producers went out into Newark, New Jersey with a picture of Linda Hamilton from the video saying to liquor stores, to homeless shelters, to the train station, has anyone seen this woman? And finally, after a couple of weeks, we found her. And my producer said, John, you have to go and, and meet her and she, bring your laptop so you can show her the piece, because of course she has not seen it. So we sat on some church steps in New York, New Jersey, me and Linda Hamilton, and I showed her the piece. And I said, do you remember me? She goes, yeah, you were the guy at the corner there. I said, yes. She goes, I said, well, you know, we got her the $8,000. We opened up a bank account for her. We got her a place to live that we paid for at ABC. We got her medicine that she was supposed to be taking because she had suffered a stroke and medicine she was not taking. And the thing that made her happier than anything was we got her her own cell phone. So like a 12 year old girl with her first phone, she was jumping up and down and I said to her, now Linda, the next time you witness something, you can call 911. But then I said to her, Linda, people are calling you a hero. They created a Facebook page for you called Touched by an Angel. Are you a hero, an angel? She goes, no way, John. Let me tell you what happened, she said. I think, she said, I think God put me on that corner on that day because he knew you were there with your hidden cameras. And he wanted me, a homeless person, to give that message to your audience. Who better than someone who's walked in the shoes of the homeless? So this afternoon, I leave you with that message from Linda Hamilton. Here was a woman who stopped and helped a stranger, a man who was down, not because she was gonna be on national television, she didn't know that, not because she was gonna get $8,000, a place to live, medicine, and her own cell phone, she didn't know that. She did it because as my mother would say in Spanish, her corazón, her heart, told her it was the right thing to do. Thank you for having me here, it's been really fun talking to you, really, really good, thank you. And I think uh, mm, we have, uh, thank you. We have time for some questions, I think. If you have any questions about the show or my life, yes, or the career, journalism. Mm -hmm. This man? Yes. Are you surprised that they still agree 
yeah, all the time. You know? <laughs> I try to come out, I try to be really gentle, because we want them to show their faces. We could put them on, but then we, if they don't sign, in fact, we could put them on, we could put anyone on the air legally, even if they don't sign a release, because we're in a public place, in states that allow hidden camera filming in public places. No one can film you in your home or through your window, ever. But in states that allow it, each state in this country has either a one-party consent law or a two-party consent law, which is based on wiretapping rules. And basically it says, if, if, you, and, if I'm, you and I are talking, and I'm recording what you're saying super, uh, surreptitiously at a public place, I don't have to tell you, only one person, it's a one-party consent law, I have to, only I have to know. In two-party consent states, both of us would have to know before I start recording. So this is all to tell you that we cannot film what would you do in California, we can't do it in Florida, as much as we'd like to go in January to Florida. Uh, so um, we, we don't, but, but legally otherwise, we could put anyone on the air, but we don't want to get a reputation as a show who ruins people's lives because we put them on television for our show and they look like you know, callous, mean people. But ironically, even though we ask them to sign releases, even the folks who do the most god-awful things were like, when am I going to be on television? I want to tell my family, you know, like, where do I sign? Uh, there are those who don't, and that's why on the show sometimes you see their faces blurred, um, but often they do. And in fact, I would say 90% of the folks want to be on the show. Maybe it's my approach. My producers say, John, you're like Gandhi. You walk in, you're very gentle to these people. And honestly, I don't want to be judgmental. I don't go in and say, you did the wrong thing. You know, how could you be so racist? No. I tell people, this is a free country. You know, everyone can express their opinions. You can react the way you want to. And I'm sure other people agree with you. So if you want to be on the show, that's fine. If you don't, you know, it's up to you. And most of the time, people sign releases. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I was a journalist for 20 years. I was really active in the National Association of Black Journalists. Oh, yeah. And the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Yeah. And a lot of us would sit around talking about how in our newsrooms, because we were racial minorities, we were there to do black stories or brown stories. Mm -hmm. And some of us didn't want to carry that missionary's burden. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever wrestle with that? And sort of being pigeonholed into a certain kind of story? Yes, sir. You want to be, if that's what you want to do, if you want to carry that, that banner, fine. But if you didn't, you shouldn't have it forced on you. Did you ever have to deal I with that? I think at the beginning, I mean, with that? obviously the reason I was hired was to cover Latin America, right? <laughs> because I spoke Spanish and you would expect the Latino to cover Nicaragua or Mexico. Or, and frankly, I didn't care. It was my opportunity to work at this great network, and it was my dream to someday work where Geraldo used to work and Peter Jennings worked, Barbara Walters. Um, so I took it and I ran with it. I figured I'll do the best stories in Latin America and this network will realize, I'll force them to realize that I'm not just a Hispanic reporter, I'm a reporter who happens, a good reporter who happens to be Hispanic. And it wasn't long before I was doing stories in Africa on Jane Goodall and uh, stories in the North Pole and you know, Vietnam and all kinds of stories that had nothing to do with my ethnicity. But I think sometimes you have to take advantage of that. If that's the only way I was going to get my foot in the door, I gladly took it and then proved them that I could do other stuff. Yes. Thank you for coming, Mr. Quinones. Um, you were, as you say, a product of Upward Bound. I used to work at and just a great program. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't. But with the cuts and Upward Bound, what would be your advice you'd give to other young people of color who weren't born into great situations? Uh, that resilience, what, what, um, what advice could you give those young children on how to be resilient and move forward? I know it, it sounds simplistic, but it's just not giving up on that dream. Wanting it so bad that your eyes never get off the prize. And that's what, I, that's what I had. And surround yourselves with people who believe like you. My best friend in school, you know, there were gangs, there were drugs, there were all kinds of bad stuff. But my buddy was Louis Rodriguez, and he had just arrived from Mexico like two years before. His Spanish was worse than, than anyone's. And yet he was the kid with a dream. He wanted to be a lawyer. And he said, Johnny, I'm going to be a lawyer, and you're going to be a television reporter, and we're going to make this. And together we teamed up. Uh, so if you surround yourself with people who believe like you, that helps. Obviously, I had a set of parents who, 
pushed me and said, you know, follow your dreams. And, and as hard as it was for them to let go, uh, they allowed it to happen. Internships are so important. If you can get your foot in the door at a radio station, it doesn't matter if it's a country music station on the outskirts of San Antonio where you're feeding the horses, it doesn't matter. Uh, get your foot in the door in whatever profession you're interested in. Um, and just keep asking uh, and, and, and begging if you have to. When I went to Columbia University, I was accepted, but I wasn't given a fellowship right away. I was accepted first, and then I had to pay for it myself, right, I thought. So I flew, I took a cheap flight to New York, uh, an overnight uh, flight for $75, I'll never forget. And I went and knocked on every financial aid door at the school saying, I desperately want to come here, but I don't have money. Can I get a loan? You know, can I work here? You just got to want it bad enough. I think that's the key. That's the key. Yes, someone else? Anyone else? Yes, back here. Thank you so much for Tatiana from Russia. <laughs> Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> Thanks so much for we your... We took a picture earlier. <laughs> we did. I wasn't dancing at the tables at the bar, just so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you so much for your inspiring presentation. Oh, uh, thank uh, you. Showing that. What I'm wondering is, from your perspective, you're doing this for a number of years now, and mm. from your perspective, uh, what does it tell about the society? And how can we, um, on the local basis of the community, use this information, what we've seen in the program like that, uh, to change what we do? Well, you guys are already doing a lot of it at the Kansas Health Foundation, by the way. You're giving of yourselves, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's just you're trying desperately to help those who need it the most. Um, but I, I think that it reminds us, doing this show, I've learned over the 10 years that we've been doing this, that as much progress as we've made in this country, and we've made a lot of progress in, in racial matters and, and accepting gays and lesbians and transgenders. The world is a smaller place because of the internet. Um, as much progress as we've made, there are little reminders with every scenario we do that there's work to be done, that we're not there yet. Uh, and you look at, you listen to the tone and tenor of the politicians these days, in particular Donald Trump, who's saying such ugly things, and it's so divisive. That bothers me. I mean, I think we have to have a vibrant Republican Party and a vibrant Democratic Party, and then let the chips fall where they may. But when we hear such ugly talk, and, and it's so condemning, it reminds us that, that there are work, there's work to be done. And it reminds me that we need to do more of these scenarios, uh, and certainly ones that, that, that involve other religions and other, other, other ethnicities, uh, those are my favorite scenarios because they resonate, they resonate with the audience and they teach you such a wonderful, wonderful lesson. So I think I've learned over the years, having done this, that, that yeah, there's work to be done. We're watching, you watch some of these scenarios and you just want to throw something at the TV set, right? When someone does something stupid or does something so uncaring. But then just about when you're ready to give up on humanity, along comes a man like the guy with the gray hair and dressed in white. He's like he fell down from heaven, right? <laughs> and says, you're wrong. And sometimes at risk to themselves, um, tells us exactly what we should be doing. And so it, it's taught me some great lessons. And I want to hope we can do this a lot more. And I, I think the show already is back this season. And ABC says it wants it already for next year again. I hope we don't run out of, when we started doing it, we thought we would run out of ideas, you know, 10 years ago. And here we are, 500 scenarios later, still, still coming up with, with ideas. And that's why it's important also to travel with the show, because the reactions that we get in New York are unique and different. You, you are New York where everyone, you know, there's all kinds of cultures and all kinds of languages spoken. And, you got to get along because the guy cooking your, your food is Mexican, the guy driving your cab is Indian, and the guy you know, doing this. We have to. It's a melting pot. But in other parts of the country, not so much. When someone has never met a gay person or a Mexican or an African American or a Muslim, people make judgments based on what they've heard or seen on television. Sometimes it's out of fear. So it's wonderful to travel the show and go to places like, I wish we could bring it here to Kansas and do something here. Uh, I don't know what the state law says about, is it a two-party consent <laughs> or a one-party consent law? And by the way, by the way, you know, our show is not a scientific study. We, we try to make it clear to people that 
what we find in our little scenarios is not the definitive word about how America is reacting to certain issues. An expert, a scientist will tell you, no, that was, you need a bigger pool, right, to draw conclusions. What we find is what we found in one restaurant on one day, in a little part, wherever, it certainly doesn't reflect the whole pie. But I think it does give you a little slice of the pie, right? It tells you, it gives you an indication where American views are leaning these days. Someone else? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Oh, he became a lawyer. <laughs> yes. Louis Rodriguez. Yeah, no, he's, he's in San Antonio. He's a great lawyer, and we're still in touch. Thank you. But, you know, really, if he hadn't pushed me, I might not have done it on my own. So you need, it's, it takes a community. It takes everyone. Um, so the show is back next Friday, 8 o'clock Central Time. And uh, see what you think. We're doing some interesting scenarios next week and for the next 13 weeks. Thank you for inviting me. God bless all of you. Really, thank you. Really good. Good to be here.